we called ourselves Pikani, Pikani Nation. And I'm also a Walla Walla in Wasco, Warren Springs. And my uh, other chieftain blood is from Chief Joseph. He's my great great uncle. My great great grandfather is his brother. His name is Alicott. And Alicott was one of the war chiefs who died defending Joseph and them 40 miles from the Canadian border. That was Elky Little Leaf giving us some insight into his Native American lineage and family history. And equal part stories and equal part tips and tricks. Just as I like to roll. Whoa, 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 whoa. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Elke and Alicia Little Leaf are on the podcast today to break down how they fish the salmon fly hatch and how they get their clients into big Deschutes River red sides. We find out uh, why you need a micro spay and a six weight rod, why you should be fishing the middle of the river, and how you can dress your flies up to stand out from the pack. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsors. Since 1977, the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has long been considered the Angler's Magazine, with original how-tos and technical articles written by the best trout and steelhead anglers in the West. They are committed to sharing exceptionally written essays, fiction, poetry, and in-depth guides to fly tying and fly fishing. FTJ is one of my go-to magazines, and if you haven't checked it out recently, you can get started today by calling 1-800-541-9498 or heading over to the web at ftjangler.com. Gotfishing.com is your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips. You'll never pay a dime extra for the trip you book, and in many cases, less than advertised. Find out where Got Fishing could take you by heading over to gotfishing.com today. That's G O T fishing.com, or reach them by phone at 208 630 3373. Gotfishing.com, the easiest place to start your next fishing adventure. So without further ado, here is Alicia and Elke Little Leaf from LittleLeafGuides.com. How's it going, guys? Good, good. Excellent, excellent. Great. It's uh, it's really uh, really fun to have you on here. We've been, you know, I've, your name has come up a, a few times over, you know, since I've been doing this the last few years, this podcast, I've got about, I think, over 140 episodes now. And and we've talked a little about salmon flies. We had uh, uh, Smaralio with John on from the shop down below a couple of years ago, and we've talked a lot about steelhead. But I wanted to dig into to the salmon fly hatch again because I know right now it's it's kind of hot and heavy and and all that. But before we get there, can you just talk about how you both first got into fly fishing and then how how you came into a, a couples guiding team up there? And I, you could start wherever. I'm not sure where you want to, how far back you want to go, but maybe how, how did you first get into it? Uh, I personally got into it about 17 years ago. Um, I just took a big interest in it because I I come down to the D shoots a lot and I always see a lot of fly fishermen out there. And uh, as a youngster, I grew up fishing on a spinning reel and fly fishing kind of took my interest. So I got out and started reading books what I could here and there. And one day I went to a a thrift shop and I bought a used fly reel and rod and it had it even had uh, the fly line on it and even had the grasshopper fly so nice. I went down to Shears Bridge and my cousins them they went to go dip and I brought my fly rod with me and I didn't know what I was doing I just started swinging it around and I remember watching that Brad Pitt movie so I was trying to mimic that in my mind <laughs> and messing around and I don't know, probably like my 20th cast, 25th cast, right around there. A big brown trout came out and pounded it. And it was like a 19, 20 inch trout. Wow. It did a good fight and I landed it. And it was a pretty cool day because my cousins, they spent all day, didn't get any fish. So I came back with my my brown. I was pretty (laughs) happy. And Took it home that night and cooked it up. And my first taste, it was horrible. It was probably the most horrible fish I ever ate. No kidding. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. So that was my first and last time I ever eaten brown trout. <laughs> yeah. So where was that? Yeah, right below the Shears Bridge. So Gotcha. Yeah, it was right there in the back end. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't think of I don't think of brown trout that that often in the lower river, but yeah, I guess there's some brown spread out through there. Right. So Alicia, so and then how did you I'm not sure how you guys connected and all that, but you, how how did you get into fly fishing? Well, my my husband had gotten me into fly fishing. One time I, I was, we were at my grandpa's house and my grandpa and elk were false casting around an old fly rod my grandpa had. And I just went and mimicked what they were doing. And they said I was a natural. And I'm like, a natural at what? I was very oblivious. I had no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, from that point on, he taught me so much first First, he had to put up with me and tying all my knots and my flies for me and putting my leader and tippet and everything on. I was pretty spoiled in the beginning. (laughs) Then I had to learn how to do it all. (laughs) Exactly. And we progressed into, um, he he came home one day from the mill before the mill was shut down here. And he said, I don't want to work. Um, for anybody anymore I want to start my own fly fishing guide service and my mouth dropped I'm like what and (laughs) I couldn't believe it it was a good great goal to have and everything but I was getting thrown into it just being a complete greenhorn (laughs) yep (laughs) are are you now are are you the only uh fly fishing um you know, from the, on, on the Warm Springs side, are, are there other people guiding out there? Yeah, there's a few other out there, but there's none that are, um, married duo, excuse okay. me, like ourselves. We're, we're the only ones. Yeah. yeah. And are there other Native American, uh, guides as well? Yes. Oh, there are. Okay. So I didn't even, yeah, I guess there, I think of one, uh, is there kind of an older guy, right? Is there still an old guy that used to guide out there? Or is, I might be thinking oh, of somebody I'll, else. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. Al Bagley. Exactly. Tired. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He, he was the guy I remember way back in the day. And then, and then it seems like you guys kind of t- took over and now you're, you're leading the way out there. Is that kind of how, how it, uh, are you having any trouble finding, uh, putting together guide trips as you get plenty of clients out there? Oh, uh, for the salmon fly hatch, we're booked out like before the year begins, pretty much people are booking about a year out in advance and then we get flooded with many last minute um, people that are trying to get in and they don't care for shuttling a drift tour. They'll squeeze on because they just want to oh, yeah. just want to get in on this hat. Yeah. So that's right. And some of the past guys kind of kind of put a bad reputation out there. So we had to clean it up as in being true Native American fishing guides. Uh, me and Alicia both grew up traditional. So we grew up learning our native custom ways and. We learn to value and appreciation more so than life and other people that just claims to be native and, and use the, the guide as a leverage for themselves. But yep. we do much more than that. We're advocates and we go out and <clears throat> stick up for our natural resources. We went and participated against things like Nestle when they were trying to come on to Columbia and mm-hmm. bottle our water and they're against our uh, treaty rights of 1855. So there was a lot of bad stuff going on. and. Even our own tribal leaders weren't paying attention to it because uh, just society's kind of like it turns everybody into puppets. So everybody kind of just relaxes, but they're not seeing the destruction and harm as like what me and Leisha are doing, what we're doing on a daily basis. You know, they don't see the things we we see. You know, this is part of our environment, so mm-hmm. we have that instinct. And when something something bad, we we know it. You know, just like. Probably last six, six, seven years, we've been finding the black spot parasite on our on our trout and on our steelhead, um, cocoa pods, freshwater lice. You know all these uh, algae, all these new things. They they opened our eyes. So we're more so as advocates for you know our natural resources. So we get out there and and speak on that more so. So I I, I like rather having that title more than a just to being a guide, you know, it's something that we do and it's heartfelt, something we're meant to do. That's right. That's, yeah, that's And ma- one amazing. of our, one of our, oh, go, go ahead, Alicia. 
Oh, sorry. No, I was going to just say, add in there that, you know, uh, to have something wild like what we have here, you have to give back. So that conservation is a big key into what we have down here. Um, we, you can't just be takers of what, what we have, you know, all these beautiful big fish, the rainbow, the red side, the bull trout, and the steelhead, and so forth. But um, we give, we donate a lot of our time and tours to, you know, local conservationists, um, some nonprofit organizations and uh, the Northwest Steelheaders Association, the DRA, mm -hmm. um, the list is extensive. So, I mean, we even, the PGE had a given campaign down here in Warm Springs and it was involving our local boys and girls club we donated to that because it's, uh, it's so important to give back to your community and to your tributary that you take so much pride and have so many precious memories that are made on a daily basis or annually or you know a lifetime so um and without doing any of that we wouldn't have a future in fishing we wouldn't have a livelihood we wouldn't have anything passed down to our future generations all our children and their children yeah, and that's what we do with the the fish camp. That oh, that's at. the Northwest Steelheaders Association. They have a fa uh, a family fish camp every oh, every yeah. spring in March, and we donate uh, the weekend of our time to go do the fly fishing one hundred and one for them, and to also uh, show them that there's still natives around and that we we're here, we care, and we're giving back and. Mm that we put a whole new twist on their camp. They never had any fly fishing 101. It was just all spin fishing, gear fishing stuff. And this would have been our third year, but the COVID-19 just wrapped yeah. their its hand, everything up, you know? Yeah, COVID. Co <laughs> COVID has made it tough for everyone. I, you know, I love what the way you're talking about, you know, what you're talking about here. And, and I've, we've talked about this on the show and I talked to this, I've got a, two little girls, they're six and eight and, and they love whenever we talk about Native Americans and how, you know, just the history, right? And you you talk about it, the the giving back to to um, natural resources, and I I, mean, I think I think you especially, right? Being a Native American, you appreciate that where it comes from and how the animals are kind of part of your family, and and that history is beautiful. I mean, what what would you say to somebody who, you know, doesn't quite understand the whole thing? Is there a place uh, that you would recommend where they can kind of maybe? kind of give back to what you guys have going or learn more about the, the, you know, the native Americans and you're warm Springs, right? Yes. We're warm Springs. Yeah. So, so yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of generally kind of thinking out loud, but I always talk, my girls are so interested in whenever we talk about like just this weekend, we were down at Max Canyon and we were down there and we were hiking around and we were picking up rocks and looking at stuff. And, you know, you got that area that's uh, surrounded by a fence that's kind of a protected uh, Native American, uh, you know, area. And and they're just so interested in it. You know what I mean? And I want to, like, bring them to the next level. What would you recommend? Should we come out there and go fishing with you? Or what, what would, if, if I want to get my girls more into it, what would you tell them? Oh, most definitely. That's a, a majority of why people will, you know, come fishing with us. Because not only is it just about the fishing, it's about, teaching and sharing our culture our history and our heritage and just being just being able to share that with everybody and uh, whether they're young old or whatever it's it's just a new thing and they learn a lot you'll, you'll consume a lot of info while you're here i mean no <laughs> we'll talk your ears off all day. that's perfect <laughs> so if i so if we come down there and go on a trip with you we can sit back and, and you typically are floating right you put in the boat and you're doing a float trip Yes, we do both the drift tour and the walk and wade. We have a Pavati. What is your Pavati? A, a Pavati warrior. A warrior Pavati, and it, it can seat four anglers, has three doors on it, and swivel Bentley seats, plenty of cup holders. I mean, it's a really nice, comfortable boat. You'll probably fall asleep in it. It's it's like a Bentley of drift boats. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So can you talk a little bit? Yeah, let's dig into the, the salmon fly hatch a little bit. It, is you know, maybe just take us there. I've had a few questions from some people, some listeners of the show that were interested in, you know, going over there. And if we stay on the dry flies, let's just start there first. Maybe take us to the river. And right now, as I know there's some bugs coming off, what would you tell somebody if they're kind of new and they're getting ready to go out fishing, you know, with you or maybe just on their own? What do you tell them if they're thinking about the dry flies? For dry flies, you definitely want to have a variety 
um, and you also want to have a variety of sizes. Uh, those two factors are very important because the D shoots fish could be so finicky because there's such a big, huge variety of food for them. I mean, there's like every hour there's a, a different hatch going on. Hmm. It's just like a buffet. And once you start seeing the, the flies out there that are flying, you could start matching the size and, and pay attention to what, what they're eating, the mergers, uh, you'll have a lot more success. And speak to like, you know, the supply shops if you need some information. They'll hook you up on it that you need to go with. Gotcha. What do you what do you like? What like right now, if you were going out tomorrow, what what are the uh what are the two, you know, couple of uh, salmon flies you're going to be putting on there well the weather's turning cold so i like to pull out some green drakes because the green drakes likes to hatch during the salmon fly too and they like the cold wet misty days cool days i've i've gone on days where it hailed on us it was like a monsoon <laughs> we just got pounded on a boat as soon as we landed you know we all had salmon flies we start throwing salmon flies out uh nothing then all of a sudden, I noticed a whole bunch of swallow birds start flying out of nowhere. And then I start seeing the black wings come out all over in the water. And I knew there they were the green drakes. Hmm. So I hand, handed everybody a green drake, told them to put it on. Every As soon as one of the first guys casted, he got a, a fish. So it was like every cast, the whole river came alive. The, the green drake hatches it isn't very long. It's pretty short. Mm -hmm. You know, it could vary 10 minutes, 20, 30 minutes if that. But, uh, but once it's on, it's the most amazing hatch because like I said, the whole river came alive with porpoising fish of all sizes, even still had size fish. Wow. Wow. So, so that's a, I mean, that's a good tip to remember that it's not just about putting on a big, uh, a big foam fly or something. You got to really still kind of match what's on the water, what you're seeing flying around it. Is that, you know, is that the, where you start first seeing what's out there, what's on the leaves and try to match the size and color? Yes. And, and as a self-taught tire, you know, after I paid attention what the store-bought flies does and, and I got enough to see the aerodynamics and everything, how you could start putting your own twist into making fly. So I started to develop my own and coming with my own ideas and they've been better than any store-bought fly I bought. So... <laughs> That's been working to the to the key. What what is your is it is the you have a name of like one of them right? Is it the predator or something like that? One of your patterns? Yeah, I have like five five variations of the predator. Okay, and, and is that what does that look for somebody that hasn't and seen it? And they're called the predator. Go go ahead. Oh, they're they're called they're called that because some of the <laughs> some of the trout they were just viciously taking them and grabbing them and everything, and that's why he's had to alter it a few because. Some of them, they just grab it and it, or they see it and they go up to it and then boom, it's like in their eye. So he altered them. And <laughs> so, yeah, I was like, wow, it's definitely a predator, Javi. It's like in his eye. <laughs> yeah, it's like attacking them. That's... Yeah, so, um, but he's he's perfected it and he's had so many. And I've, I'm his number one fan on his predator fly. I refer absolutely refuse to take off his predator until late july i'll still catch fish on it down here with a predator and a caddis trailer or mayfly or like a little purple haze or something mm -hmm. so it, it's given them fish the option of do i want that big juicy steak or do i want that little tiny little mayfly you know and it they sometimes they'll go for both i know <laughs> so, <laughs> that's cool but that's, that's what happened yesterday. I had um, elk's predator on, and I had we the the rain was trying to come in. the The pressure, the, the wind was coming, and it the temperature dropped on us. The flies were flying, but they weren't really flying that actively, and they weren't really dropping on the river or anything. So I decided to tie on a mayfly, like a size fourteen mayfly trailer, and. Uh, we have 3x. We use 3x down here. If you do not use 3x, you're gonna donate flies. Mm -hmm. So you gotta beef up your beef up your fly line for sure. The leader. Yep. Um. So I I had 3x on for my salmon fly, and then I had um 4x for my tippet. And I got my 20 inch red side in on that uh, mayfly on a 4x tippet. 
So, wow. and it's all about, not it's all about not muscling them off. I mean, it's, yes, it's so fun when they dance and splash around and they're doing their acrobatic jumps and everything. But at the same time, it's just all about grace too. And you know, poison grace now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That, that sounds like so, a pretty cool. So where could I, so if I wanted to find that pattern, can you find it online or is there a place that you could take a look at it? He is trying to get his fly uh, patent still to oh, be cool. sold. Yeah. But so. I, I do tie them for our clients. Oh, mm-hmm. you do? Okay. So our clients, if they want to buy them, they'll email me and um, say how much they want and Elk will tie them up for them. Gotcha. I got one story for my fly. Probably one of my most proudest uh, successful accomplishments, too, as a fly tire. Uh-huh. Um, when I first started taking an interest of tying flies, it was probably like seven years ago. And I always went to the thrift stores, bought books, and seen a lot of Jim Teeny stuff. So I, I read a whole bunch of his books, and his, How to Tie Flies, and kind of take a, taking a liking to Jim Teeny mm-hmm. and, and his wife, Donna. And so I did my own nymphs and everything after you know, learn what I did from Jim. And a few years back, oh, what, about five years ago, we had a, a two people cancel out on a trip. So they were filling it in with some other people. And they said, do you know, they were talking Alicia, sorry. Mm. But I, I overheard it. And they said, do you know Jim and Donatini? And I looked at Alicia and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he <laughs> said, they're, they're going to fill in place. Oh, cool. So they came out and uh, the first year it was awesome. Jim, he, he never done a dry fly. No so kidding. The first day I got with him, Alicia had him like a half a day and I, I only had a half a day trip. So I, I got to meet up with her and then finally got to meet Jim and Donna. And I was just talking with Jim and we we're at Whiskey Dicks and mm-hmm. he just had a new fly that he tied up. It was special flashing that he had and he hooked to like a 22 inch out like right next to me while we're just talking Jeez. so that was pretty neat <laughs> so he came back the next year it, it was hot those that year and the next year was also hot it was like during the drought season too like really hot but uh that's when i was confident in my predator that was working and we were probably fishing four hours and Jim wasn't getting nothing on his nymphs. Jonna was killing it. She was <laughs> killing them on my flies. And she was probably like a hundred yards down every 10, 15 minutes. Woo. You know, <laughs> she'd get a nice 15, 16 inch fish. And I, I never knew Jim only preferred to fish nymph. I always thought, you know, he switched yeah. it up cause he always goes all over the world, you know, goes to different areas to fish. So I thought he was, you know, no, nope. wasn't selective on that. So I said, Jim, you want to try out one of my new predator flies? He said, sure, Elk. So I, I gave him one. His third cast, he got like a 21-inch fish. <laughs> no kidding. And then he said, Elk, you gave me uh, so much confidence. He said, I'm going to I'm gonna do a, a, a lineup of three salmon flies. So that was pretty neat. That's... And, and huh. when he caught the fish, he told Donna, he said, Donna, it's been since 1972 since I last used a dry fly. <laughs> that's amazing. So that, was, that was neat. Yeah, I did, I did not know that. So <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, Jim is, a, I've learned a lot about Jim over from this show. Like I said, I've done, uh, you know, over 140 episodes and he was on in episode five and um, I've kind of known him a little bit over the years, you know, through family and stuff and but it was funny because in episode 124, Bruce Chard was on, and he's a Florida guy, and he kind of told a similar story about Jim. He knows Jim really well, and he said that Jim was out there on fishing for tarpon, and it was one of those things where it was like the last minute, the last cast of the day, and he hooks this um, gigantic permit, and it was just this unbelievable, and Bruce just was blown away. I think Jim just has this, there's something about him, he's got the magic, you know what I mean? It, says, it sounds like that's what you yeah. saw You saw that day. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That's that's good stuff. Um, so so maybe you could watch that. I mean, there's probably some people out here. We we 
you know, cover the whole country here. And, you know, obviously we're talking about the Deschutes, but can you talk a little bit about what you guys, you know, your guy, you've kind of got the west side, the east side of the river, and maybe just break it down so somebody understands what's going on, where the reservation is, where you can and can't fish. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we have probably about 35 miles of fish and waters, and that's just for, that's the travel guides, and six miles, about five or six miles of it, the tribes has a reserve spot for the non-tribal fishermen where they can get their permit and fish it a certain area without us but right now it's closed down of course because of the virus yeah but uh but with with me and alicia's services we get to take you out of that area area two so you don't have to you know run around you go with us you're the big fish we'll take you out to the virgin spots so but the the where the river um the access starts for us is under the deschutes bridge underneath it at worm springs or at mecca just above mecca yeah yeah right across from the mecca area it starts from there and then then it that's the then it goes down to that area that elk's talking about the upper dry creek campground that's what he's talking about where the non-tribals can go fishing five to six miles give or take there's a lock gate in the beginning at upper dry creek and then there's a lock gate at the end when they get to that lock gate, there's a sign up there, you know, stayed in that. That's that's the end of the line for them. Yep. So then after that, then it's private access again. And like what Elk was saying, that's where we can take everyone fishing and towards the border of our reservation. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty good real estate. Um, we don't see other anglers out. Um, we And it's, it's naturally social distancing when you're on the reservation side. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, you have no problem with that. There. So is that, and you guys usually pull out right at at the at Whiskey Dick, right? At that is that where you typically pull the boat out, or do you fish down below that? Yeah, that's where Elk takes his drift tour uh, um, from up at South Junction area down to Whiskey Dicks. Yeah. And how many miles is that river miles? Elk? Six, sixteen for the drift trip. Yeah. yeah, about sixteen river miles uh, for the drift trip. 16 river. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So basically you got 35 miles, but really only five or six of it is what somebody could do on their own if they wanted to. And then, and you're talking about the West side of the river, the whole East side of the river is open completely to everybody. Um, but we're talking about just the West side, right? Yeah. Right. Right right now we're just covering the West bank and, um, the East bank is that all, all that, um, the warm Springs boat ramp down all the way down, you know, (laughs) and that's the public side. Yeah. That's the public side. Okay, good. So that that's good clarification. Okay, and and so you know, again, taking it back to the river. So we're you know we're heading out there, uh, and you know next week, and you don't know quite sure you know what to put. What would you recommend is for getting geared up? I mean, I guess you made a good point, uh, Elk, about the uh, talking to your local fly shop. But, you know, for dries, is there anything specific? I mean, you know, I know, again, I've used a lot of stimulators. I've used some foam flies, stuff like that. Do you have a good diverse selection um, or, or what, what's your box look like? Uh, I got like a lot of caddis, a lot of black, gray, brown, green caddis, size 14, 16, 12. And then stimulators, you want a lot of stimulators too. Mm-hmm. You want from size but 10 to size, size eight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then get some like chubby Chernobyls. Those are really, really good popular fly. But size that, six, size eight. And 10. And 10. Um, the, for the stimulators, the Normwood, the Normwood is a good one. Oh, yeah. And the Normwood special, it, it just has legs. That's why it's special. But oh, okay. um, anything with legs. Yeah, they, they love the legs, man. <laughs> Do they? Yeah. If you're going to be fishing public areas and you go get your flies at a store, you got to remember that those fish, majority of the time, are going to see the same fly, most likely. So get like a black marker and then you could like mark the bottom up, put polka dots, you could make, mimic an egg sack, put stripes on it, even different colors, you know. Uh, those things make a big difference. You know, awesome. I've cast out before with a, a salmon fly and went three or four times, brought it in, marked it up, waited like five minutes, cast it, boom, got hit. Just that little difference makes it make the day. That, that's a great tip. And another thing 
important thing, especially if you're working like the Deschutes River, a big river, mm-hmm. is, is evening winds come out. And Wrong those way. winds will eat up a three, four, or five weight. So you want to bring like a six weight so you can cut through those winds single hand. Yep. And micro spray is another another good thing to bring for the D shoots. Mm. Uh, really lightweight. You can get pretty far out because there's those fish are in the middle too. So towards the evening time, that's where I like to cast in the middle of the river because you know the big hogs they they're kind of like sun shy. So once that sun goes down, they're out cruising out that middle. And boy, you hook them to those big ones, you better have a good, strong leader, mm-hmm. at least 3X. Be good on your drag. <laughs> yep. A lot of those travel straight still had power. Nice. That's a, that's a awesome. Yeah, that's something a lot of people don't think about is that outside the river. And would this be in water that kind of would be like maybe water a steelhead might hold in or something like that? Or what, what type of water would you be looking at in the middle of the river? It's just like when I go spay fishing, it it's like cracker jacks. You, you never know what you're gonna pull out because you have bull trout in there too. They hit, they'll hit on a on a swing. Big red sides, it's that instinct, so they all hit it. You know, same thing with a salmon fly. It's like Alicia's big fish last night. Took that little size, 16, 14 fly. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, I I watched her porpoise up for it, and I was just praying she was still on and i i kept made sure i kept that pressure on her and kept her on but not muscling her i caught her on a a five weight sage (laughs) rod Hmm. so yeah she pretty she flexed my my rod around pretty good yep we we uh (laughs) we land steelhead on trout deer like five weight (laughs) six weight no kidding (laughs) And, and we like to play around with lighter tippet and we'll mess around with like a seven pound <laughs> yep. it all becomes skills at that point oh another important factor though for um on our section of the d shoots we got to pinch our barbs i know that's hard for the beginners to do because you know you want to keep your fish on and but it's it's a requirement to pinch our barbs in we got to do the barbless hips down here yeah you, and the good thing is you don't want to hook yourself I had a coffee this morning one day, hooking my thumb, Ooh. and it was bar. Uh, yeah, been there, been there, done that. <laughs> but uh, other than that, um, for gear, you at least want to have waders too, good and good stud, because there's a lot of algae and there's a lot of banks and hillsides, and and have a walking stick. And another important thing is never walk fast especially if you're in thick, brushy areas or, or a lot of debris and stick. Because the snakes, the snakes are out this time. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. No, so, um, well, I'm thinking about maybe if I'm not quite sure, but hoping maybe in the next uh, week or so I'm going to be getting out there. I'm thinking about taking, you know, like I said, my I got an eight-year-old uh, daughter who's just getting into it. If I was going to bring her over there, you know, and she's uh, she can cast a little bit, but she's not, a, you know, obviously not an expert. What would you tell me if I wanted to, help her find some fish you know what i mean i mean obviously we're probably going to be on the other side of the river but are you always looking under trees i mean what, what would you tell somebody if you had somebody that's kind of a beginner yeah if it's if it's full sunlight you definitely want to look under the trees and cast near the embankments right in the grass i've caught many fish and taught many people how to catch fish just doing like a little simple uh, slingshot bow and arrow cast yep. right over the grass you know you're ducking down and a lot of older guys, you know, they're like, hell with that. I don't want to squat down. You know, it's, trust me, it's worth it on occasions, and especially if you hear those splashes and you got an idea where it's at. It's worth it. There's monsters that are just laying right on the other side of those grass, you know, the yep. weeds, just waiting like sharks. Hmm. Well, and if, if she can't do the Bonero cast, then literally dangle the fly with just the um, the the length of your leader, like a puppeteer, over that tall grass and hide behind the grass, yeah. and they'll go that way too. It's just it's very effortless. Like Elk said, they'll be right off the embankment. So plenty of people caught them that way too. But what a lot of people like to do is they get into the river, like they need to, like we're still head fishing or nymph fishing or something, and and they kind of make a lot of noise and splash around and 
kind of surprised why they're not catching fish right away. Yeah. But you kind of blew out your hole when you're making all that noise and tromping around. So it's like stay on the embankments and hide as much as possible and blend in with your background. That's that's the key for the beginners. Don't wear a bright orange shirt, bright baby blue or, you know, just yep. the fish will see you. <laughs> yeah. That's a good. That's a good tip. So basically, just yeah, even dangling. So if you've got a big uh, stimulator on, you could just kind of flip it over the grass and just dangle it. Just touch it on the water and move it around a little bit. Give it a little bit of action. If and if there's a fish there, it might come up and hit it. Oh yeah. And, and even put a dropper, a tail on it, you know, from twelve to sixteen inch, and she'll have two and one chance. It's easy. Is it? Is that what you do typically? You'll you'll put you'll just uh, tie one off the shank of the hook, a little t- a smaller caddis or something like that. Yeah, if you work close up in shores, yeah. But if you're casting far out, you know, doing long casts, I wouldn't recommend it because you'll you'll get knotted up, especially with that wind. I was gonna say there's times where, like last year, the water was so high that the fish weren't coming all the way up. They weren't committing for the top water action because it was so high and the temperature was colder. So they, we weren't getting top walk, water action until towards the evening time. So to get our clients started, you know, we we're running like a dropper off the salmon fly. And then once they start taking the top water, then we took off the tail. Oh, there you go. So, so a dropper. So you were you, so you're fishing like a nymph dropper off of the, off of the, the, the stone fly. Yeah. Nymph merger, little mayfly mergers, mm-hmm, the small ones. Gotcha. Just yeah, just like a dry, dry, kind of a dry dropper thing, right? Right. Nice. Okay. And and are you overall are you fishing nymphs? Like you said, it depends on the water temperature. But are you fishing them pretty consistently too, or do you are you mostly fishing dries throughout the season for for on the salmon flies? With children, they're getting every arsenal out there. They're gonna get nymphs and dry fly, whatever works. <laughs> yeah. Nymphs is probably one of the most successful ways for anybody to. To get out there, the only thing drawback is the cast. You know, the casting is the hardest part because uh, yeah. it gets tangled up some more than a single dry. Right. What about um, what about Euro nymphing? Have you? Uh, I know I've got a friend that's been, you know, he's been out there doing a little bit of that. Is that something that it would probably be effective over there? Have you seen any much of that? Oh yeah, it keeps you busy. It keeps you really busy. Um, but it, it's limited though to go to certain areas, so that's we don't usually use your know, nymphing that much because we got such bigger areas. And I think your know, nymphing is more so for smaller sections. Mm. You got like a lot of big rocks, but yeah, you're just kind of limited to cast. So that's why we like using a bobber with the indicator, and we'll take off the indicator and fleet free swing it without an indicator. So we do it two different ways with nymphs. Yep. Yep. Just swinging down. So with a, a nymph, you might just without an indicator, just kind of cast out and swing it down or are you casting up or how, how would you do it without an indicator? With the indicator, I like the choppier waters and stuff that you could kind of control the depth more. And then with the, when you take off the indicator, I like to get deep in deeper areas. I'll go with the deeper bug. And of course, you'll get bigger fish doing that too. So beware. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so what? I mean, you've probably seen some pretty nice fish in there. I mean, what? What? Uh, as far as those red sides, have you? I mean, you've seen a f- some fish over twenty inches. Is that pretty? Uh, how often do you see fish like that? The biggest one our client ever landed was twenty-seven inches. Wow. My wife landed the female hen at twenty-six inches. And the last biggest one I heard was in a trap last year from the from the fishing game, yep. natural resources, and it was a another twenty six inch female. So, yeah, they get huge. They're, they're local; they stay around. Yeah, they stay around, and that, and you could tell them. I mean, because you get the steelhead up there too, right? When do you start fishing um, uh, for steelhead uh, in in that area, or is that where you fish? Do you cover that area for steelhead too? Yes, uh, our steelhead start getting here uh, late September through November uh, for the ones willing to freeze in December right now. <laughs> yep. we, we fish till spring pretty much, so we we guide year round for the, for the steelhead. So they come in, they're still even coming in now. 
That's yeah. So you're fishing. I mean, so you're pretty much all the way through and up, up until pretty much they're starting to spawn. You could still go out there and, and hook up with them. Yeah. And I, my favorite time is probably from mid September to mid late, late November. Um, because it seems like they're more aggressive around that time mm -hmm. and they're prettier. I like, I like the red flashy colors, you know, the, the red is, it gets me. And a lot of guys, you know, they'll go to the coast and stuff. They catch them all bright and silver. Me and Alicia goes out to buoy 10, you know, get them a lot of silver. But once they come through that system and they, you know, they go through that change of nature, it's just like a the most prettiest colors. When you land those fish, it's like kind of like if you're a dad, you know, a mom, you're looking at your, your baby for the first time. So you, you see those pretty colors, and get your picture, you know, let them go and, it's the colors that gets me on a steelhead, and not just the fight, but yeah, the beauty of it in itself. Wonderful fish. They're amazing. And now a quick word from our sponsors. Gotfishing.com, a boutique booking agency for fishing adventures around the world. Got Fishing is unique in working with a small hand-selected group of outfitters from around the world that are known for providing an experience that is second to none. Got Fishing can be your trusted source of information with access to the world's best fishing trips, their sole purpose is to help you plan the most authentic fishing venture while making sure it fits within your budget. The beauty is that everything they do is 100% free. You will never pay a dime extra for your trip, and in many cases, less than advertised. I can attest personally to the service that Got Fishing provides as they have been working with me closely to set my first trip to the Yucatan for saltwater. They have taken care of all the important details and allowed me to avoid worrying about any of the complications. I know Brian and the crew have you covered at Got Fishing. Whether you need a fishing consultant, travel consultant, gear pro, or the like, they have you covered. With top-of-the-line outfitters they represent around the world, they are confident they have just the right trip for you. You can give them a call at 208-630-3373 or head over to gotfishing.com to get started today. Let Got Fishing help you plan the fishing trip you've been dreaming about. That's gotfishing.com. I forget that in the center are rivers and fish unspoken for. That there are valleys, the strata of which we lower into perhaps in the hollow between breaths. In the tiny pause between the rise of summer and its departure, I nearly forget the long sieve of winter, the absence, the fractional glimpses of light. Dear one, I will go without speaking. A blaze, keep me until I disappear. That was a poem by Molly Dam in the summer edition of the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal. On top of uh, some great poetry, as you as you hear here, uh, FTJ is jam-packed with another round of great articles in diverse departments. Joseph Rosano uh, is back again, provides another classic steelhead uh, lesson for everyone. We hear from Garrett Lesko in a stacking deer hair frenzy. Find out about striped bass from Angelo Peloso. And hear uh, from Dave McSe uh, McNeese on singing the blues and material dying. Lots of additional articles in the summer edition, including an editor's interview with yours truly about how I became a fly fishing podcaster. Craig uh, did a really good job with this one, so I'm, I'm pretty uh, proud uh, to be in in this edition. I believe I have found the perfect sponsor for the show. I would be uh, it would be really great if you can uh, support FTJ by heading over to FTJ Angler. Dot com and subscribing so you don't miss any of the tips, tricks, and stories in the next issue. That's ftjangler.com to get started today. And uh, tell them, uh, tell Craig and the crew out there you heard about um, the magazine from the podcast, and I'll find a way to uh, put something extra special together for you. Okay, back to the show. Uh, they are. that, And I think that's what I was thinking back to that episode with Marty and me. I think Marty was talking about, he mentioned... I'll have to put a, a little clip of it in here. I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said it was pretty cool because you were doing some things that other people weren't doing on the Deschutes for Steelhead because you were up there just in your own little zone, right, fishing for them. And it was a little different because the fish are up higher in the river, so maybe they're 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 a little troutier or something. I mean, could you talk about, I'm not sure how much you fish in the lo lower river, but how, how are the fish different and how is fishing for Steelhead different there than it is you know, on other parts of the Deschutes? Or how, how do you do it differently? Well, we don't have like, you know, like the lower part, they have more different on top water. They could swing flies and, and get action like that. But for some reason, our area, they won't uh, swing and go for the top. I mean, rarely, 
but I haven't ever seen anybody, you know, go out there and do it. I had a few guides that swore up and down they could do it, and they didn't do it. Um, yeah, so that's – and steelhead are tricky. They're really tough fish to try to find, and I've been finding the last – three, four years, they've been changing their tactics. They've been changing on where they've been laying their spawning grounds and stuff. And I think that's because different fish are coming in and pushing them out, uh, different salmon, you know, uh, mm. loss of habitat for where they, they could spawn their eggs because of the algae. Oh, right. Uh, water changes. There's a few sections I haven't caught still had in like four or five years now. Just because the temperature change and the algae growth kind of took them out. Yeah, that's that's definitely yeah that the whole system's changed a little bit. Yeah, and I guess we I think people talk a lot about the trout. But that's a good point. Is that yeah it's, it might be affecting steelhead just as much because they're spawning in that area throughout throughout that area that's being affected. Right. And now I think that is what Marty, yeah, that's what he he mentioned that you were, I think he kind of, he was Joe, he said it was kind of funny because he said you didn't necessarily get up early, right, to fish. You didn't have to because you could fish, you're fishing down deep. And are you using sinking <laughs> lines? <laughs> oh, yeah, sinking and, and dry. So we we don't work in too deep of a section, five, six feet max. Um, we, we run spay rods, switch rods, single hand. Um, a six weight and five weight, like I said, eight and a half pound tippet, a uh, little copper John nymphs oh, that wow. I'm caught in them. Uh, that, that's what, what, that's probably what Marty's talking about is that we are catching them on a little trout setup with literally trout, little nymphs and everything. And um, <laughs> no we, we'll have a tan one. We'll have a big stone fly on and then we'll have like a little copper John on or something. Yep. And, um, we both, we both went in one section and ran our flies and we both caught a steelhead each and they were both hatchery. So we kept them both and it was just really fun and unique because my steelhead rolled on my strike indicator and went on my fly. But I was, I told Elke, went for my strike indicator. I had a, a hmm. real pink, bright strike indicator on. And it was just weird that it did that, but I caught it and it, it takes us a little bit, it takes it takes a while to bring them in on those single weights like that, but it's fun. But elk ties his um, big old, what are they called? Articulated streamers. I got like 215 patterns for a steelhead and salmon fly. So what he's oh. noticed is he's had, to, he's had to downsize them. They're not the big old gaudy ones that they had to be, you know, what, five or six years ago? Yeah. Now they're like micro mini streamers what they call them now so uh -huh. like um just like with the salmon fly we've had to downsize they're not the big gaudy size six and eights we need a 10 huh. you know <laughs> yeah so and it's, things are changing for sure mm -hmm. and on different levels um another note is for the beginners when they do come and they're trying to check out the rivers they need to kind of be familiar with what their CFS, what the regular CFS is in that tributary that they're fishing. Like right now we're dropped down to like 35, 3600 CFS. And if it drops even more, the fish are always more active on the drop as opposed to being really high flowing rivers. All right. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you catch on the drop, you're going to be, you're going to be better. Does the river, do you see it on the Deschutes going fluctuating uh, that much? Oh yeah, it's yeah. it's horrible because we had to adapt to how the the CFS works on a river. So I know it so much now, or I know when the fish are gonna bite and when they're not gonna bite. And it's awful that we have to adapt ourselves to to a man made thing like that you know, because it's a lot of pressure change. You know, you're going up and down with that water, kind of like a a diver. Yep. You know, coming up too fast with you know with air, so it hurts them. So you got to think how that does on those fish on a, a daily basis like that. Not not just affecting that way, but it affects them mentally too, probably stresses them out. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Know, any factors. Right, right. Um, I wanted to touch on, just before we get out of here, uh, uh, you know, I want, wanted to hit on a couple more on the salmon fly, but I did have a question about, you know, I've always had this, uh, I've interested, you know, I've been around the Deschutes and, 
we talked a little about your background history. I'm not sure, did you guys grow up on the Warm Springs Reservation? And can you talk a, a little bit about what that was like maybe for somebody who, you know, hasn't had that experience? I, You know, you hear different things about it out there. I'm just kind of curious, to, could you paint that picture a little bit for us? Was it a, you know, was it a fun experience? What, what was it like for you guys? Uh, for for myself, uh, I, I grew up, born and raised, yes but I did not realize how much we had. And for one, we're a closed reservation. That means, you know, we're private. So my mom's reservation, Yakima, is not a closed reservation. It's an open reservation. So non-tribal members could live on their reservation up in Yakima. And it's, oh, wow. what do you call it, industrialized elk? Because they have, like, stores and malls and highways and everything, you know. And, yep. Uh, so... When I moved up to Yakima when I was 19 and I tried to stay up there, I, I could not stand being in the city. And I couldn't, well, it's a city, literally. It's, it's a reservation, but it's a city. But uh, I couldn't stand how loud it was, how many people there was. Uh, there was just no private anything, really, unless you went out to the woods or to a river. But um, I find my eyes kind of opened on that part that reservation or warm springs reservation i was born and raised here i had to come back i didn't want to stay up there anymore and i didn't realize how much we had down here as far as our river our lakes all our natural resources that we harvest year round um which is the huckleberries the wild celery the um the roots that we dig Mm -hmm. uh, much more so to um I was, I guess I would say I felt really sheltered being down here uh, <laughs> and, and, and still do. So the, and the fact that we have the Deschutes at our backyard is a big blessing. Yeah. Um, and uh, don't take it for granted, but it literally took some years maturing and growing up to do to appreciate it even more so on a whole nother level of to becoming like we said conservationists and mm-hmm. whatnot and public speakers so yeah. um to me it, it's amazing to have what we have and hopefully we can continue, continue to have what we have and be a voice for our natural resources because they can't speak for themselves no no how so, so elk how about you was it similar for you you did you did you always appreciate the you know what you had there and or were there some struggles along the way um i grew up in portland so i was born and raised in portland oregon and my dad he was a entrepreneur pretty much on almost everything he he learned our customs how to dance how to sing how to dress uh he's very artistic he learned to carve uh, paint to draw almost anything he put his mind to he did he spent many years on a railroad so that's why he lived in the city <clears throat> so yeah i grew up pretty much in portland uh had a lot of friends from the city and we we fished a lot with my dad my dad took us all over the place so we we're like fishaholics we fished on the, in the rivers on the lakes in the ocean you name it we, he did it. My dad is out there. So I learned quite a bit from him. Cool. Not, nothing for fly. It was all, you know, spin fishermen, bait fish, sturgeon, still had whole nine yards. Uh, yep. We always came back here to, to Warren Springs. We'd fish the D shoots. We used to camp along the D shoots way up by Whisk White Horse Rapids. And we used to have our teepee up there. We used to be the only family that had our teepee up there every year. <laughs> So we'd spend like a week out there and I'd have my little bow and arrow run around. I'd have my spinning rods ran out of worms. So I started using salmon fly. That was the <laughs> second best and grasshoppers. And yeah. that's how I got my first fish at, oh, what was I, seven years old. I used a salmon fly, got it right there at Whiskey Dick. So I've been fishing since 1976. Oh, or setting. yeah so i'm 51 now so quite yep. a bit of knowledge <laughs> that's it so so you didn't necessarily grow up on on the reservation but you were in portland but you always had a, a strong connection because your dad because your dad and you guys were well since 76 you guys were out there and and you you know enjoying everything right so 
even though we lived in the city, that was a thing that we had always done. So yeah, even though I lived in the city, I probably spent more time in the woods than most people here on a reservation. Exactly. That's, that's, that's cool. And are people out there, do you, do you see, I mean, it seems like are, are there are a lot of, uh, you know, fisher, fishermen, hunters, and things like that on the reservoir. And, and it, it seems like it's a pretty, I mean, Warren Springs, is it, uh, it's pretty good size, right? I mean, that whole town is, there's quite a few people still, right, in in the town? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, what, close to 44,000 people that live here in this Oh, town. wow. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Well, that, yeah, I just wanted to kind of get a, a take. I it was always interested because, you know, I've driven through there many times and, you know, sometimes stopped at the gas station, sometimes stopped at the store. You know, sometimes we'll we'll talk to a you know some such random person at the boat ramp, or you know, it's just been I've had all these little encounters. But um, you know, I think that's what why it would be fun for me to get out on the river with with you two, and especially with my girls. I think that'd be really they'd really like be blown away. You know what I mean? Like to do that. So we should definitely keep in touch with that. Maybe if we can't do it this year, maybe next year, or maybe for Steelhead. Um, uh, if it, if it works out, but, uh, yeah, well, let's, let's just kind of wrap this thing up here with salmon flies. Again, I, I try to wrap uh, the show up. Typically I call this the 222, uh, top two tips, top two flies, top two resources. And if you think about uh salmon fly, salmon flies, any other fly patterns you would recommend if somebody wanted to grab two, you know, two stone fly patterns that would be good, you know, for the next couple of weeks, what, what would you tell them other, other than the predator, anything else? Uh, like the, the classic Norm Woods is all around fly to use. Okay. Um, did you know Norm, did, Norm Woods was, was he, he was out on the, he was a, a guide on that river. I, I didn't know him, um, but I have friends that knew him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so yeah, so Norm Woods, so we get that and the, we'll dig up, we'll get some of the, the, of your predator. And then what about tips? Any other thing else you'd throw out there as far as, you know, say I'm out there with my daughter and, you know, we're trying to find a fish. Well, what else would, would you say for tips for, for helping either me or me or her get into, uh, into a nice trout? What, what, what would you tell us? Uh, have floatant. You definitely want to use floatant. Okay. And, Cause a few times once those fish get your fly, it's going to get all sticky and gooey. So you want to dry it off best you can because it's really important to have your fly stand up the wings because they have to see your profile you can make your fly any color you want even pink white don't huh. matter as long as it has that profile then that's what's going to get it cool and have a net of course you want to have a net for sure <laughs> oh, okay have a net. and what's the, so the profile you're talking about just the fact that they can see see the big wings on, on the pattern or what else makes a big profile that you want to stand out yeah they, to look like a little sail, you know, like the two little wings sticking up. Yeah. Just like how they come out of the water or where they, when they land. That's what it, you're trying to mimic that silhouette from underneath. Gotcha. So you don't necessarily want the, the wings laid up on the back of the p- fly pattern. You kind of want them sticking out kind of irregular or just out there so they're real obvious. Yeah, I like I like mine sticking straight up and it's easier to see. Use bright colors too if you're gonna tie your own fly. The brighter the better, like orange and pink. Pink's like the hottest color. Even towards low, low light condition, pink's my favorite, especially in riffly water. You know, if you use traditional white, they'll just blend in and you lose your where your fly's at. But when you use like pink and orange and stuff, you can really see them and they stand out. Okay. And that's just on uh, like a, that's a tuft you're putting on, on top of the, the wing or is this something like for the body color? Yeah. On the top for the wing, the indicator wing. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And, uh, perfect. So yeah. And I'm just looking, Alicia, I just, I just saw your photo there. Wow. That's the, that, that's the 20, is that the 20 inch fish you just, or is that the 26 incher? That's the 20 inch. The 26 inch I caught was on a Jimmy leg, uh, stone, uh, a nymph. Yeah. Wow. I'll, yeah. I'll put a, <laughs> th- I'll put that photo in the show notes so everybody can take a look at it, but it looks like, I mean, that is, it looks a lot bigger than 20 inches. That thing is amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it helps being really petite and having small hands oh, that's too, right. yeah, and yeah, knowing so how to do that. There you go. You're sticking, yeah, you're sticking out a little bit. Right. Right. Okay, yeah. Um, what's that? Before that, I hooked in. It'd be hard to believe, but five minutes before that, Alicia landed out. I hooked into like probably the same size. 
it jumped out of the water. It broke me and jumped out of the water like three times. It was so mad it jumped three times. With I a thought, fly in his mouth. I thought, I thought elk still had it on, but it was like swimming up river away from us. It was a slabber. <laughs> <laughs> Just tore you up. That's awesome. Uh, that's cool. Uh, well, sunscreen. Oh, my God. Sunscreen is important. Sunscreen, chapstick, carry your water. Yep. But a high desert is really pretty rough. So evening times, I always carry an extra jacket too. Okay. It gets cold. And at allergy medicine, a lot of our clients find out they're allergic to juniper, poison oh, wow. ivy, something drastic. And it's, so it's good to have like a little, um, what's that called? Benadryl kind yep, of just Benadryl. in case. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Watch, don't let your dogs run around free. Oh yeah. Cause they'll get hit by a snake or something. Yep. And lots of ticks. Lots of ticks. We haven't got, yeah, that, knock on wood. <laughs> What's your secret there to keep the tick the ticks off of you? Uh, there's like an essential blend of essential oils. I can't remember them at the top of my head, but I know you can Google it. Um, okay. You can blend essential oils together and put it in like a little squirt bottle and then just spray it on you. Uh, that's a That's a more holistic, natural approach as opposed to getting all these heavy chemicals yeah um, all the nasty chemicals that's right okay yep. uh, ideally just try not to rub yourself on the tall grass you know if you try to stay away from the brush and the grass then you won't get them on you that much at all okay but if you start rubbing yourself on the grass stuff then that's when they usually latch on and that's start it. crawling up <laughs> that's it okay um and uh and finishing up that 222 so resources i, I usually try to ask this too to it sounds like you, you are both out there doing your own thing, but any other recommended resources? I don't know if there's a um, any books or magazine or other guides or any online, anything come to mind where if somebody wanted to dig deep deeper on how to get prepared for the salmon fly uh, trip, what they might do? Um, just like I mentioned before, just check your local fly shops first. Um, and they usually kind of point in the right direction for what like, gear and stuff. Yeah. What's your local fly shop? What's the cl the one closest? Isn't there one right up the road from you guys? Uh, the Dishes River Fly Shop. It's run by Vale Born. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, this guy. They got camp in there. They got uh, RV, cold beverages. RV hookups. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, they got it all right there. They even got uh, rentals. You could like rent a drift boat and stuff like that too. So really, really good people. Oh, Some cool. cold brew on tap. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. That's, that's yeah, you always got to have that. That's perfect. Uh, okay, so I've got a question here. This comes from Shanna. Let me just read this one before we get out of here because um, I told him he's getting ready. He, he's going to be going over there, and and I wanted to – he had a question for you. Let's just, let me just read this out to you and see if this makes any sense. We've talked about a little bit of this, but he said, um, he said back in the day he used to use uh, stimulators mostly because he didn't know what he was doing, but he um, – then he started fishing the foam flies, right? And they kind of worked and he kind of switched back and forth, but he felt like maybe they quit producing, you know, what, you know, like one fly quit working. Do you see changes in, you know, flies like working based on hatch timing or, or other swings in productivity? I mean, what would be your take, you know, on that? What, what do you see out there? Do you see one fly that works year after year or do you, do you always see changes? Uh, my predator always works every year. <laughs> that's, that's that's the secret. Just throw the predator on there. Yeah. Um, it, like I said before, too, that you know when you work in those public areas, you, you always want to try to go with something di different. Yeah. Um, different sizes all the time. Size is very important. You know, they won't go for the super huge bugs. Uh, we stopped going with the size what six. Mm -hmm. We no, stopped no using size. six for like three years now, I believe. Mm -hmm. Barely at eight oh. sometimes. And that's because the, the river temperature dropped and the river got clear again. So before um, we made gigantic gaudy flies, streamers and stuff, dark colors because the water was dark. It was more algae. So now it's clear. So that's why I started going to smaller gear, smaller salmon flies. Um, gotcha. That's pretty much to work on just and and look up the cfs before you go out and see yeah. what the what the flow is like right now we're at like 38 so it's a little higher than it's been in the past couple days so you know they're not really they'll be active but you got to really 
it's a, it'll be challenging and you'll be switching up your setups. It's good to bring out your nymph rod and your dry fly rod. So your chances will be better. Okay. So you're going to have determination. Uh, determination is a strong thing. You got to have, um, don't quit. Just keep going for it. Put all your best into it. And it's bound to come to you. We all, you know, start out and it's not that easy, but if you just keep at it, it's eventually going to come. Yeah. Perfect. One thing I wanted to add in, um, I forgot to mention that we're currently working with a nonprofit that I won't list yet, um, but we're going to get some, we're doing some restoration on our section of the river. We're going to get some trees added in and more shrubbery and stuff oh, for cool. our section because we've, we've suffered a lot of damage from the fires in the past and now beavers and otters. But um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, that's something. That, we're, that we've, we've been working on for like over a year or almost two now, but now we finally found someone that's a perfect fit and we'll be, might be doing a post to recruit some volunteers to come help find oh. some stuff and sweet. But yeah, it's a, it's a project that's long overdue. It's needed. And again, it's all about giving back and it's helping out our fishies that we like to catch and everything and they need that habitat. So, and uh, the other key, we always use in our post is the water is life because none that we everything that we do incorporates water we require water every day to live the fish do everything we eat that is grown takes water so it's um you'll always find us saying that hashtag water is life all the time that's right that's right and that was a big thing mm -hmm. right a year or two ago over in south dakota north dakota wasn't that kind of on the same lines or they that that, that that was the kind of hashtag too, right? Water is life. That's where we got it from. We went down to Stand and Rock twice. Oh and wow! We we didn't feel like it was just a fad. It's something we had to keep going and pursuing and carrying on as Indigenous. So that's why it's incorporated in daily posts like that for sure. We we first went down on our thirty-seven foot long canoe, and we, it's called Brother Brother Canoe, and yeah, we're, so we went down and made history. We we're like the first uh, people to go to the reservation in like over 150 years, VIA by boat access hmm. from another tribe. So it's pretty neat. Wow. Um, our, our name Little Leaf comes from my, my grandfather. My grandfather was named Jack Little Leaf. He was a chief in Brockett, Alberta on the Blackfoot Reservation. We called ourselves Pecani. Connie Nation. And I'm also a Walla Walla in Wasco, Warren Springs. And my uh, other chieftain blood is from Chief Joseph. He's my great great uncle. My great great grandfather is his brother. His name is Olicott. And Olicott was one of the war chiefs who died defending Joseph in them 40 miles from the Canadian border. You know, my uh, Wasco blood, I'm from Chief Alhai, and he was a, he was a war chief when Chief Kamekin was a big main chief. You probably don't know all those names, but they're in the history books. Oh. So, yeah, from three proud chief bloodlines. And at least uh, she's from Chief uh, Simtestus. Oh, no kidding. Look. Wow, that's... That is... Uh... <laughs> I would love to sit here and hear get a, a history lesson for the. In fact, we were just be like I said because we were at Max Canyon. We were talking about that with my family, and we were kind of going back. And I always I'm so curious about that, right? I mean, if you go back ten thousand years, or if you go back fourteen, I mean, how far back do do you are you really into all the 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 longer term history on, on what's going on, or what you know? Because I I kind of think back, how far back does it go with, with those bloodlines and everything you guys have? Oh, they got real far back. Yeah. See, like the black people, they say we're from we're from the stars. So right. they say we're not even from this planet. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of tribes you know, they have their own uh beliefs and stories and things like that. Yep. So it's pretty cool. You do you, do you have a story? I mean, do you have a story you remember that as a you know, a kid or something that you're grandfather or dad told you that's kind of a, a cool story about you know that you remember now to this day yeah never ever go berry picking by yourself um 
or with your kids or your, your women, never leave them alone because uh, Bigfoot might steal them. <laughs> Bigfoot. And so, so you guys, so you believe in Bigfoot too, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, hey, what about what about the horses out there? Just I'm always curious about that. You got that pack of horses that you see down there a lot at towards White Horse and Whiskey Dick. What, what's um, is that just a pack of uh, horses that somebody they're they're wild or they take care of them? What's the deal there? Four years ago, where we had way too many horses. I think we had like seventy five hundred horses. So they Jeez. got rid of them, trapping them, and adopting them out. And now they got it under control. But the wild horse population was bad because they're trampling our natural vegetation, competing with the wild animals for food, uh, just taking over terrain. They're, they do a lot of damage. You know, when they run in our herds, you won't think they do damage, but they tear up the ground pretty bad. Uh, yeah. Even on our section of the reservation, we have a fence line that runs all the way down and it protects the shoreline just be from the, you know, because of the horses and cattle. When they get to the water, they eat it all the way to the shoreline. And since our tribe's been doing that, our side of the river's been becoming like a dang jungle. So I even carry a, a big machete. So a lot of people probably freak out seeing me like, oh, big Indian, big knife. But <laughs> that's for, you know, all the poison oak and briar. There's a lot of invasive plants, too, you know, poison ivy and stuff like that. So. We're always chomping through. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So that's the, so they're out there, and there's still a few left, but you've basically t- taken most of the herd, got it down to a manageable level. Yeah. Okay. Um. And and do you, is there another? If somebody wanted to dig in, where would you send somebody if they wanted to learn more about the history? You, you just talked about all this amazing stuff, going back to Chief Joseph and, and everybody, and you're just in your family, which is amazing. I mean, wh- where would you send if somebody if they wanted to just learn a little more about? kind of the stuff where you came from and the people and the culture we have our own museum here oh okay yeah just stop by the and museum it's right on it's, it's right on highway 26 and it, it breaks down the warm springs the wasco and the paiute um lineage or tribes down here and elki and myself are both warm springs and wasco descendants and what my grandpa explained to me is that we are the the Wasco band is a descendants from the Chinooks band. So the ones that aren't federally recognized, the Chinookans. So yeah, they're from Astoria. Yeah. Oh, from right. the Astoria. Mm-hmm. That's right. So Alicia's grandfather is like the tribal historian here. He's 90 years old and he's the eldest uh, veteran here. And he's an author of two books. When the river ran wild, it's about the Columbia River Gorge and mm-hmm. Salilo before it got dammed up. Uh, George Aguilar Washington Sr. is what um, the name of the author. Mm. And his second his second book is called The Shattered Civilization. And I'll quote him on this when he said, it's a fictional book of what we would be like if we were not colonized. Like, how would we be living oh, wow. if we... Yeah, so... <laughs> right. If you yeah. if you weren't colonized and if, if the, there weren't white uh, settlers ever or, or the... Or are you saying before or, or what, you know, I'll have to look at the premise, but the premise is basically what would it be like? Yeah, basically, if we were still in our our origins of where we originated from and, you know, weren't pushed onto this reservation, this is not where we're from. Um, this is just where the government put us exactly. and put banned us with the other tribes and the Paiutes were enemies back in the day. They were our slaves and. Yeah, so it, it, it get the history is ongoing and like I said, when you go on a tour with us it it'll be nonstop, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, was all pretty much the, from the Astoria all the way to Salilo. Well past Salilo. But yeah, they the Shinnikins were the, the biggest powerfulest tribes in the old days because they controlled the trade route all the way up the coast to the Macaw reservation to the tip of Canada. And all the way down to the Nez Pierce lands through the Columbia. So they were really hmm. big, big tribe back then. That's right. That's right. The Chinook. And was the, I mean, the Dalles was the big meeting place, right? That's where everybody, and was the Deschutes a, a big corridor that people used to get to the Dalles? 
Or, yeah, the Celilo Falls. Yeah. Yeah, that was part of the corridor, right? That's why you see so many. Even yesterday or this week when we were there, we were hiking up. Um, up the hill, right? We hiked to the top of one of the mountains up. I took my daughter, I told her, I said, I said, she wants to go deer hunting with me. And I said, okay, if you can make it up to the top of that 2000 foot mountain, you can go deer hunting this year. And she made it. But on the way up, we found all sorts of, um, you know, like uh, chippings from tools and arrow, you know what I mean? Not arrowheads, but just the, the rocks. I mean, it seems like there's stuff everywhere. Do you, do you, do you see that all over the land, just places and all sorts of, uh, evidence? That's funny you uh, spoke of that. Um, that's one of my passions is uh, looking for what we call thunder eggs or geodes, volcanic geodes, gas bubbles that fills a few millions of years, like about 66 million years to make a thunder egg. The agate, some of them are hollow, some of them are, are solid, full of agate. And I've, I've found pretty big giant ones where I, I can't even lift them up. I've hmm. found a few that's pushing a couple thousand pounds. Jeez. And I've packed about 155 pound eggs out of canyons a couple miles just on my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But I found 60, 60 thunder egg beds and I started about being a rock hound about the same time I started fly fishing. Two, 2003. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and since then, yeah, I found 60 different beds and world-renowned material where some of it's unknown. I found, like, thunder eggs that are full of, like, green opal, green and blue opal together, which is the two rarest colors to mix in the mineral world. The green and blue are the hardest colors to find. Hmm. And wow. we had a friend evaluator collection that they're worthy enough to have their own museum so i've been collecting uh documenting the areas and naming the beds and i plan on finding 100 beds before i leave this earth that's what my wish is to do there you go so, that sounds like a good goal what was it you mentioned uh alicia you're were, you were talking a little bit on that uh end of the um you know the history right you talked about on this reservation i mean what is that when you look at that now obviously it was a, a you know, kind of a terrible time and what happened. How do you look at that as a, I mean, I know how I look at it. Uh, it. It seems, you know, totally terrible and how it all went down. But how do you look at that, the history and how, and what do you get out of that? What do you take from that now where you're at? How do I look at the history? Well, I mean, just the fact that, you know, we, everything that happened, right, this terrible, they came in and, and were put on, you know, the, the Native American tribes were put on these reservations. I mean, what, what, you know what I mean? Like, I, I just try to think again, I think of my daughters and, and try to explain to them. I've talked to them about this before and it's hard to explain to them what happened, right? Because it, it's so terrible. What, what would you tell me that, that I should tell them to, to help them understand about, about everything and how it all went down? Well, for one, it, our our history is not really taught in the public schools. Um, it has it all has to be passed down through our you know our elders and our ancestors, and we keep that uh, word of mouth and stories passed down from generations to generations. But it's not taught in your schools. It's not taught in the like the the ki the kids in your in Warm Springs aren't taught the the history, the actual history. Yeah, no, not the truth isn't taught oh, is wow. what I'm saying. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, I grew up in high school and everything in our history had nothing to do with any of our, <laughs> what happened to or anything. So there you go. Um, but so that's a big problem. Um, but you know, it, 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 it's hard to comprehend what happened and everything, but it's something that it's taken its place, it's taken its course, and it's up for us to get back to our roots and who we are as indigenous and everything, whether it takes your whole lifetime or not, um, and appreciate what you have and embrace it. Like, I barely just got my native name from my grandpa, like, last summer, and I was always called my from my grandma, Pawinch. She's from the Ute tribe, and that, that was beaver because how red my hair gets in the summer. So I I, I grew up like traditional but not traditional i grew up in a church and my dad and my grandpa were almost dead set against the powwow the sweat lodge they're so colonized in, in a sense 
but I was raised to be a traditional picker, a harvester, pretty much. Like we'd pick from morning till dark, you know, mm. and it, it was because we're picking for the elders that couldn't pick anymore. And I didn't get to participate too much in the longhouse um, stuff, but I was almost, we was almost getting raised pretty much as those traditional pickers mm. because we'd, we'd, pick more than we'd ever need or whatever, but it was always given some huckleberries, some roots, some salary to our elders that can't do it no more. And we leave the easy pickings, which is right by the road or close to where we're at for the elders and for the young ones to learn how to harvest. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that I learned and that I'm still learning um, when it comes to our traditions and stuff. Um, I embrace the sweat lodge. I love it. We need to build our own. But how I feel about the past is that you can either let that consume you and have a chip on your shoulder about it, or like I said, just go with what we have now and mm -hmm. embrace it. We're, like what me and Elk are doing, we we're, we have our livelihood is off of the, the land in a sense, you know, we make our living off of fishing and <laughs> giving mm -hmm. back and everything. So, um, I feel cool. like we've, I've done a way to me. Well, I, since when me and, when Elk met me, I was like being all materialistic and cared about hair and nails and all that and <laughs> whatever. Now I'm just like, yeah, I'd rather fish. I'm so addicted to fishing yep. that it, it's our medicine. It's my therapy. That's why I, on Facebook and Instagram, I'll say I got a session of river therapy in today or that's the therapist. That's the doctor, you know, <laughs> that's yep. the pills now. <laughs> So, um, so, but I just, I just think that we have to go with what we're given and not, yeah, not my husband always says cry over poured milk, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> build milk. You know? That's a good, yeah. So, it's a good way to look at it. Yeah. No, I, I think it is a great a great way to look at it. Yeah, and I think what you're doing is is amazing out there because I think people are seeing you and I'm not sure how many like you said there's some other Native American guides out there but you know from my perspective you you two really stick out, you know, as a as a cool thing, you know, that I see you and I think you know, I think you're probably rubbing off on other people right in around your area that are like, "Oh, they're seeing you doing these great things." You know what I mean? That's what's cool and there'll probably be others that will follow in your footsteps. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so it's, uh, so littleleafguides.com is, is the best place if, uh, anybody wants to get a hold of you and maybe get a, a guide trip uh, down the line. Yes. And, uh, they can even call us too at 541-615-0402. Okay. Perfect. Well, I'll put, uh, I'll put a link to all that in the show notes and, uh, yeah, just wanted to thank you both for coming on and ha having this chat. I loved, uh, I loved how we finished up here at the end with some stories. That's, um, you know, again, like I said, I'm gonna have to d hopefully get on the river with you because I'd love to have my girls out there hear some of these stories in person. So, um, yeah. Until then, uh, thanks again for everything you guys are doing, and I'll, I'll keep in touch with you uh, as we move forward. Well, thank you, and it was our our pleasure. It's an honor to be on your show. And um, this is our very first podcast, by the way. And yeah, oh, amazing! Just had, just, yeah, just had to let you know, and we're we're honored, like Elk said. So. so there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing dot com slash one forty four. I'm looking for another person to head over this February to the Yucatan for a big uh, saltwater trip for heading out for the Big Four. This is going to be an amazing trip set up by uh, Got Fishing. Looking for two more people uh, to join the trip, so you can send me a message directly if you're interested. Dave at wetflyswing.com, and I'll get you hooked up with some info and uh, give you some details. Thanks again today for stopping by to check out the show. I'm looking forward to catching up soon. Hope to maybe see you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.